Good morning and welcome to this edition of Adeno Tonsillectomy Lecture. And uh, before this lecture, I would like to tell you that you can visit www.painfreepartha.com, my website, to get my slides. And also, you can go along and subscribe and visit my channel, YouTube, Pain Free Partha. In going to the history, it was first described by Celsus in AD 30, who used a hook to grasp the tonsil, then used his finger to incise. This developed with a common painful guillotine method. This was the start like. Now we can see the incidence of so many operations in your OAC and 11 to 20 years the maximum. We can see in an inpatient department, we can see 510 ANT admissions. 90 and normally 45 to 50 tonsil surgeries per month. This is not a big thing, but this is a normal inpatient department. What are the clinical features of tonsillitis? Sore throat, fever, difficulty or dysphagia. You can see tender tonsillar lymph nodes, which tells there is a chronic problem also. Bad breath. You can see tonsils red and swollen. These are all the clinical features of a tonsillitis. You can see if the adenoid is swollen, he may give as a different voice. There is a nasal obstruction. There may be sleep disturbances. There may be hair middle ear effusions with hearing loss. When I think of surgeries, recurrent tonsillitis. Sometimes the tonsillitis is not responding to antibiotic treatment. Many episodes in one year, so many years, this recurrent episodes is going on. All these things point out to a surgery. Obstructive sleep apnea, breathing difficulty, swallowing difficulty, an abscess that doesn't improve with antibiotic treatment. Previously, in the 1990s, what they told was, yes, in recurrent infections. Slowly, this thing has come up. Obstructive sleep apnea, breathing difficulty. So now what to look as a patient with obstructive sleep apnea or this pretonsillitis other than the routine. Now you have got an URL. What are the implications of URL? Is that patient is having OSC? How do you determine the severity or and the anesthetic implications? The role of NIV and investigations. These are all the preoperative look in the other side of a routine adenotransitis. Now, if you take anesthetic implications of URI in children, it is well established. So, perioperative adverse events, PRE, which included major cough, major breath hold, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, RV obstruction, major desaturation, more than 10%. All these has happened to me. When to postpone. Their consensus is if you have an URI, two to three weeks. If there is an abnormal chest x ray, postpone till the x ray becomes normal. There is a routine thing called holds. When is the cough? How is the cough? The onset of cough, the lung infection, how is the airway, and what is the type of surgery? Is what is holds in an implication of URI in children? There is something called snoring, troubled breathing, and unrefreshed. Because if you wake up in the morning, you should be refreshed. If it's not refreshed, then there is a problem with the night, as there is a snoring. The standardized system for evaluation of tonsil size. This is what is called, you call as a kissing tonsil. Sometimes more than 75% is blocked. But still, many times, many times, if you do a thiopentone and your macronium or suction and colon, these separate and we have channel to intubate. Mostly nothing happens. We will look, it's look like some dangerous. Friedman's grading scale. This is what is a testing scene. No tonsils seen to completely obstructing airway. This is Friedman grading scale. There is something called Brodsky scale where the degree is zero. Degree 1, 2, 3. 75% of the oropharynx. There may be unilateral 
apparent enlargement versus true enlargement. Acute infective, hypertrophy, congenital, neoplastic. Yes, we have done neoplastic unilateral tonsillar enlargement. Now we have called for a tonsillectomy. He found one side that I cannot intubate only because this tonsil is going like this and there was a complete shift here. So then what I did was introduce an LMA to this side and then shifted to a better center for a fiber optic intubation. There is something also called a Glinman's McMurray's adenoids with complete coanal obstructions from just filling one third of the vertical height of coanal. Now, what is OIS saying? We have to diagnose a patient coming with adenotonsillitis is just snoring or OSAS. OSAS means little on the bad side. Just snoring is okay. How to diagnose this? Poor attention span, behavioral issues, poor performance in school all point out to a bad prognosis or a severe OSC. Children with OSA, why we were worried about OSA? A five-fold increase in prey. What I told, major obstruction, major bronchospasm, laryngospasm, difficult extubation, cough, all these things are five-fold increase if you have a severe preoperative OSA. We can find out the fellow has come from history, C to F, fail, from A to B, A plus to B, all these things. Students report card will tell that this fellow is having a severe OSC. Now, obstructive, this is uh, OSA. I will tell the details of OSA in a different uh, lecture. But with regard to adenotonsillitis, I am touching, not the routine OSAs. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, I am not going to the details. I will just touch with regard to adenotonsillitis. Loud snoring, frequent snoring, frequent arousals, observed pauses, intermittent vocalization during sleeps, parent is reporting restlessness, child with night terrors, child sleeps in unusual positions, new onset nocturnal enuresis. All these things tell that he is going for a severe OSC. He is frequent snoring, he breathes in between, he stops in between, he gets up in between, goes to toilet. All these things, he sleeps in unusual position, sometimes shouts something, vocalizes something. All these things reports, points out to a severe one. On polysomnogram, apnea index, how much he, the fellow goes into apnea? It is 1 to 5 is mild, 5 to 10 is moderate, more than 10. 10 apneic episodes or during his sleep means he is severe OSC. And how many patients undergo this polysomnogram before this? Maybe with some anomalies. Now we can see this is apnea. See here, this is hypopnea. Means there is some flow, but it is less than 50% of flow. Now there is no flow here. But this no flow is associated with good high-tech respiratory efforts. Means the efforts are good and there is apnea means there is obstructive apnea but here there is no movement apnea this is central apnea both can be there so this is hypopnea now you see hypop apnea means more than 10 danger hypopnea plus apnea means around 20 to 30 is dangerous many times you cannot do this means just a saturation of 92 is going towards risk and 80% saturation if he gets, the fellow gets in the night once, then your prey incidence is higher. Five-fold increase, I have told, yes, they may have hypertension, they may have autonomic imbalance, they may have car pulmonale and dysregulation of blood pressure. That is what we need to concentrate nowadays in tonsillectomies. Whether this fellow has got OSA, if the OSA is how much severe? Then is there a dysregulation of blood pressure? What is the blood pressure? All these things we may need to see. And sometimes we may go for an echo to see whether there is any car pulmonary. Many times it is difficult to see all those things. If we look at the side of a patient, yes, we are diagnosing. This fellow is not a good fellow. This fellow is a good. See the difference. Now we can see this is an obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. This fellow is a good fellow. Roll of an IV, yes, CPAP, can we do? Yes, this fellow, this 
girl or can have CPAP for some time and your AHI index will have come down from 27 to 2.6 may take a few months it's because there is, this is this and that because your OSAS is constantly adenotransactive. Unless you remove the adenotransactive, your OSAS is not going to get corrected. Now, OSAS, if you keep NIV, uh, double edged sword. Unless you treat the basic cause of doing an adenotransactive, yes, that is all. Can we wait for it to a few months to get into 27 to 2.6 so that your severity of OSA is decreased? Your prey incidence comes down to normal. I'm very worried about this submucous cleft in a preoperative test. So all these preoperative tests are special to tonsillitis. I am not telling a preoperative fellow. This means you should not check whether there is an IV access. You should not check whether this patient has got already an operation. How is the mother? Fasting guidelines. All these things remain. But what is specific for tonsillectomy? I am telling. Now this, if you develop, go for an adenoidectomy here, because of the submucous cleft, they will develop a velopharyngeal incompetence. See here, velum is a soft palate. Pharynx is this. This has to come like this. If you remove this, because of the submucous cleft here, this will not touch here. So the fellow will, as soon as we do adenoidectomy here, and this fellow's voice will change, sometimes the food eaten may slightly regurgitate. All these things we should be taking care of. See when you are seeing a tonsil, there is a submucous cleft or not. Many times, these ages or changes where teeth will change, you have loose tooth, all these things has to be taken care of. Investigations, polycythemia, it products to recurrent nocturnal hypoxia. That is what is important. Coagulation screening, it is not mandatory when the patient has got some problem. Yes, screen. not mandatory in tonsillectomy. Leukocytosis means active infections. Then you can do imaging scanning, CT, MRI, in an appropriate mass, where there is a tonsillar mass, unilateral mass. All these things point out we may need to do an MRI to find out what is the cause. So sometimes there is a pulsatile mass. What is this? Behind this, there may be an aberrant internal carotid artery. Okay. This tells that we may need to be careful in tonsillectomies. Pre-medication. Yes, people use pedicloril or trichloroplast. It's commonly used in Engel children. Yes, if this patient has got OSAS, beware. Antibiotics. There are a lot of... Uh, pros and cons, but usually we give. Anticholinergic injection glyco used by many, dexamethasone used by many to decrease POINV and extubation related airway problems. The anesthetic technique previously was used these things. So we pour ether into the gauze piece and the patient gets under and then after that we give it to the surgeon. Surgeon does the tonsillectomy. In between, we pour. All these things completely gone. Up. We need to protect the air. So then, what became is atropine, thiopentone, scholine, succinate choline. Then put the tube. Then give it there, spontaneous. Don't give vecuronium or recuronium. Then, as soon as they did the tonsillectomy, then this is. Then, as they started using so much of lot of Diathermies, these things have gone now. Completely, we are going in for non depolarizing muscle relaxants. Get the patient relaxed, no ether. All these things have gone now. We can also use reinforced laryngeal mask airway. Sometimes people are not fixing this thing also. Yes, people have used reinforced laryngeal mask airways. There are a lot of things they sing, pretty safer, simpler, and speeder methods. 100, see, you can see 814 pediatric adenotransplants. It's not a small sample size. Tube is in now. We have put the tube with the thiopentone vecuronium or thiopentone scholine now. Now you have to position the shoulder here, what we call as rose position. 
and then put the surgeon will sit here and put the boil Davis cap or the doubting blade, then put the throat cap. As soon as the throat pack is given or as soon as the position is given, look for tight pack. Can we ventilate? Look at the ETCO2. Look at the airway pressure. This is what we need. Sometimes we need tight bags. Sometimes we go as ventilators. We may begin to see the airway pressure. <clears throat> How far we are compromising on the sterilization is also important. So this is the boiled gavy gag and this is the doughty gag in between. There is a hole to accommodate the endotracheal tube. Intra, now you have put this. Intraoperatively, people use fentanyl <coughs> on densetron parastomol. And very few people like me use 15 mg of clonidine. And extubate awake is my opinion. Some people say extubate a little deeper in patients who are non risk cases. No ISA. The child is old age, 6 or 7, not 3, 4. So all these things, yes, extubate little this thing. But my opinion is extubate awake. Flexion of the neck during laryngoscopy. Yes. Whenever the patient is going to be extubated, I just flexion the neck here for some time so that there is a flow of blood from here and clots from there and do a suction. And also beware, we are removing cotton, gauze, all these things because they will push the pellet of cotton into the one tonsil and keep it for some time. There are a lot of techniques also have changed. Previously, it was a guillotine method and snare method. And then it came as diathermy method. And sometimes they call co-ablation method. This is little cool method. So that is co-ablation method. They use the radio frequency. They don't cut the tonsil so much. There is very less pain post-operatively in co-ablation techniques. All children should be monitored with pulse oximeter, ETCO2. Precordial stethoscope. This is what people miss. Precordial stethoscope in the left will always tell the heart sounds and also the respiratory sounds because most of the times the slip of the tube will go into the right side. The left side, we will not hear the things. So endobronchial is easily picked up. The sounds are picked up. All the more, when you just start the case, the precordial steth will tell tuck, 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 tuck. If there is a lot of blood loss, then there will be tack, 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 tack. The sound will come down. You should hear, feel the hypovolumia with just a precordial stethoscope. Electrocardiogram, temperature monitoring, automated blood pressures. Yes, extubate awake, I have told. No bleeding, no secretions, no gaspies. It is preferable to lie down like this, which should be maintained the post-operative. This is the classical teaching of a post-recovery patient or a just unconscious patient who has recovered from any other cause of unconsciousness. Daycare tonsillectomy. This is going up every time, every hospital now. Good communication in the families. They should understand the post-operative phase and potential complications. But there are problems. Patient is an anomaly patient. Patient is a very low O, less age patient. Severe OSAs. All these things, yes. As the, and the patient has to go to a small village, 50, 15 centimeters, kilometers, then this, and from there the bus or car is very difficult. No, nothing. They have to go next day only. We should be taking care of two things. Bleeding possibility is nil and no vomiting. When these two things are there, then yes, we can do daycare tonsillectomies. Local anesthesia for tonsillectomies. Lignocaine with adrenaline. Nebulize with local prior. One in the anterior, upper and lower pores. Glossopharyngeal nerve block posteriorly. How to do it? Yes, I will explain in some other slide. It's a very simple procedure. Glossopharyngeal nerve block bilaterally will take approximately 20-20 seconds. That's all. The patient will supposed to have the position like this. The acceptance to be there for which we can have mild sedation of either Dexmed or some sort of IV drugs, minimal dose narcotics. We have done also under local anesthesia completely with uh, this thing. We can see there is no tube here anywhere and the surgeon is doing the local anesthesia. Now, post-operative problems, pain, two things, tonsil, pain, 
bleeding. Tonsillectomy pain is often underestimated. That's a major problem. One than a poor, only the uh, child. Yes, yes. Many times they suffer from moderate to severe post-operative pain. Local infiltration may help, but I am not very convinced about this because I am personally against uh, many type of local anesthetics because they may blunt the reflexes. You should be absolutely awake. NSAIDs, no. Minimal fentanyl, parastamol, DEXA. This is what we use. 60 to 80 percent POINB. That is what I told. Many times people start using propofol, dexana, and at the end sometimes ondansetron. This combination is going to produce a definite decrease from 60 to probably 6 percent. Post tonsillectomy bleeding is 2 to 3 percent. Primary is within 24 hours. Secondary is around up to 28. Sometimes there may be reactionary. So slubbing, overlying the tonsillal, loose and from underlying. So superior pole and inferior pole, these are the blood vessels supplying the tonsil. Now venous return is to the plexus from the tonsillar capsule, lingual vein and pharyngeal. Yes, we are important that post tonsillectomy bleeding is usually venous and not arterial. We have to put in our mind. What are the problems is bleeding here? Okay. Now we don't know how much is the loss because it would have swallowed the blood. That is what is called hidden hypovolume. He has swallowed some 300 ml of blood or 200 ml of blood for a patient who is only around 7 years old. That means the hypovolemia is hidden. Unless you prove the rice tube and aspirate 300 ml, you will not know. The risk of pulmonary aspiration because Sometimes what happens is after a tonsillectomy, patient is fine for six hours. He starts swallowing one drink, fruit juices. Then he develops bleeding. Now he has got a pulmonary aspiration risk as soon as you start giving anesthesia for the next time. Potentially difficult intubation. I have, I have done a lot of post tonsillectomy bleedings. You will be seeing only blood there. The previous intubation was so easy. The next intubation is a terror, horror -like. You cannot see anything like that. Oral tube, nasal tube, nothing can be put. You have to have two suctions ready, tuck, and suction it out in seconds and put the tube like. So this is what is important because anything, as soon as you put the tube, inflate or whatever it is, put the, uh, fix it and then don't bother about flexible LME, flexible tube, all these things. Put a normal tube. Airway is important. Let the surgeon adjust here and there and see the bleeding gets completely arrested. We should know that it is a second general anesthesia because sometimes metazolam may be given and it may act for six hours, four hours like that. Yes, we should seek heart rate, capillary fill time, blood pressure, tachypnea, urine output to find out the signs of hypovolemia. Resuscitation with 20 ml of crystalloids, blood ready. Note the chart previously, what the tube was talking about. What was the problem there? Was there any problem? All these things has to be noted. Rise tube aspiration, two IV lines, blood reservation, surgeon staff ready. Sometimes people use inhalational induction, lateral and scolene and put the tube. We always use rapid sequence induction, maybe some mass ventilation, rise tube at least after intubation and blood products ready. No NSAIDs, fentanyl and parastamol. And then we can have no bleeding, oral diet and discharge. Even unilateral tonsillectomies I have done. So what I felt is in the 1990s, we had patients like this for adenotonsillectomies. They had recurrent respiratory infections. They had failure to thrive. They were not taking food. And if you do a tonsillectomy, they will gain weight. The 30 will become 40. 30 will become 36. But nowadays, people are coming like this. Because of adenotonsillitis, there is an OSA with regard, with, which leads to this obesity. And again, this increases OSA. All these things come. And as soon as you remove the adenotonsil, they become like this. 
So this is what is the gross difference between the 1990s and 2020. Thank you very much. And my slides are there in painfreeparta.com, my YouTube channel.